and allow myself to introduce, sorry, I realize. Uh, okay. It's great to have with us Nadia Khan from Mind Tools for Business, who's going to talk us through the annual report that is produced, the benchmarking report on, well, it, it, you could go into the history of it, Nadia, but it's the 19th report, and it's a, always a fabulous read. Delighted to have you with us. I'm going to step back, turn my camera off, but I will be there on the chat for you. Meanwhile, I'll hand you over to Nadia Khan. Nadia, over to you. Thank you so much, Don, and um, absolutely delighted to be here doing the first of these um, digital webinars and to be invited by Don and the team over at LSG to be able to do that. As Don mentioned, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, it is a 52-page report. You will get a link to the URL at the end and you can always download the report, which is out available at the moment. It was released on Monday. You can find it on the mindtoolsforbusiness.com website. So today what we're going to really be covering is um, can rapid digitalization survive without cultural innovation? And as Don mentioned, this is our 19th report, so you can imagine next year we're already excited about what we're going to put in the 20th edition, but there is plenty to cover in um, what we've got to do today. And before I get started, because there is a lot of data to cover um, and a lot of insight to cover and we will have pause points all the way through and as Don mentioned we are really keen that you get active in the chat there's nothing more exciting than a really really vibrant and dynamic chat when you're running any of these sessions but before we get started we want um, Don and I are keen I am keen to ask you this question have you reflected on your digital implementation a lot has happened, as we know, in these last um, two years and three months, I think it is today, since the COVID pandemic um, and the rapid digitalization a number of our organizations have been through. So we would like you to share in the chat um, uh, to start a bit of a discussion around how have you reflected on your digital implementation and what's worked well and what have you identified as areas for room for improvement? If you can share in the chat, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Nadia, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, it, we're assuming people have done a digital implementation of some sort. If you haven't, no, no issue. But as you say, the past two plus years have been an absolute whirlwind of people doing stuff digitally. And you and I discussed this earlier, Nadia, the, the idea that a lot of people jumped in and did stuff pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. And and then has there been a, a sort of an attempt to step back and look at that and consider what what happened, what was good, what was bad, and and then to be selective about what happened uh, in order to then move forward with a well honed digital implementation, or is it more the case that people have put some stuff in place? and it's just sticking around. So Joe Cook has reflected on it. Improvement, Joe said, was to chunk up our training offerings and blend more. Sure. And in the future, she's going to do more appropriate tech use for supporting learning at need. That's great. Um, uh, Mohammed is saying, I think more pre-planning. I think, Mohammed, a lot of people would agree with you on that. A lot of people would say, yeah, um, we probably rushed in a bit on a lot of things and we could have held back. If you want to comment, please comment uh, in the chat exercise to the left in the, in the main box underneath the slides and everyone can read them. Um, that's great. I'm going to copy some of these over because actually it looks, it looks pretty interesting, some of the stuff that's coming in. Um, yep. Yeah. Anna is saying we used to be face to face and this has happened to a lot yeah, of people. Absolutely. Um, yep. Help the organization. We've gone to a hybrid. And I'd like to know, Anna, how you feel it's gone. Andre says, yeah, we have, but we're launching from scratch, so it's a large element. Uh, now, Michael, this is interesting, Nadia, forced to reflect and adapt. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'd be interested, Michael, to know what, what you're adapting as a result. Gert says, virtual training has exploded, but engaging the audience is still difficult. That backs, that's backed up by my research. Nadia, these sorts of comments, are they what you're expecting? There's quite a wide range of people. Thank you for being very honest. They are, about they are well. exactly what we're expecting. And I think no one will be surprised when they see some of the data I'm going to share shortly 
reflect on on this. Um, I think what's really yeah. interesting about um, the the rapid part, and I think some, uh, I think it was Mohammed who mentioned it earlier, that a lot of this has happened very very quickly. And organisations, uh, and we mentioned this in the report, you know, organisations when they were thinking about um, digital implementation. Um, were planning for rapid digital implementation. You know, they were planning for numerous, numerous number of days um, at which point they might be able to get there. In most cases, organizations went remote within 10 days of us going into lockdown, um, you know, depending on where you were globally. So there was a huge um, propelling of this rapid digitalization that happened so, so quickly. Um, and just, you know, picking up on Bethan's point there about, you know, we're finding a high level of, uh, of take up on digital learning, but low completion rates. And I think this is some of the um, stuff that we're going to come on to, Don, which is really, really interesting mm -hmm. when we look at what's happened to the index this year and what's happened um, to learning maturity and where we started to see um, some of that bedding down. So I think all of this is, um, you know, uh, very much not just pulled in through what the learning performance benchmark and the insights that we're seeing there, but in terms of qualitative insights that we get from our, our broader LNOD community sharing this with us and what we're hearing out there. But Nadia, also, I, wanted to, I just want to say thank you to everybody in the room because we're getting some really rich stuff here that everyone's sharing. They're being very honest about it, what's going on, strong conversations going on. Um, this is slide two. I think we have something like 35 slides that we want to try to get through with all the content. Uh, so listen, everybody, I just want to say we're going to be moving on, moving on from this setup in about two seconds. Well, there's the next slide coming up. So if you're, gonna, if you're having a conversation, I'm going to suggest you move the conversation over to the general chat, which is the one underneath Nadia's video. Uh, I don't want to stop while people are typing because it, and move on while I see people are typing. So da Diana is still typing. I think um, I'm going to, there we go. Okay, we're going to move on now. Please continue the chat Please uh, underneath do. Nadia. Please do, folks. I'll, yeah. I'll, also say, I'll also say that we've got Chloe from the content team at Closer Still Media, who is, is here as well. She'll have access to all of these chats afterwards. She'll be able also to pick out your comments and use that in a reflective blog that she's writing. So whatever you've written, thank you for it. It's valuable now. It will be valuable in the future. Really appreciate it. Nadia. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, we've already got people sharing, which is which is wonderful. And I think, you know, this is a really interesting aspect of um, uh, the annual L&D benchmark. For the last two decades, as I've mentioned, we've been producing a data-led L&D report to identify how L&D leaders and strategists are approaching organizational learning and its organizational impact. And the data collected via our learning performance benchmark, which is a survey, it's really giving L&D leaders the opportunity to sit down, reflect, and think about where they are at right now and the, where they want to go to. And a, a bit like what you've just all done in the chat, you know, unloading where they are, unloading from their minds, taking that time to reflect and really think about the impact of um, their learning strategy and the interventions and the investments that they've done. And as you can see, we've surveyed um, 772 leaders this year, so there's some real rich insight that we can gain from this. I just wanted to pause very quickly and um, talk you through our four-stage organizational learning maturity model, because I think it's important to set that into context for you to understand how we um, are able to plot organizational learning maturity. So through the data we collect, we are able to cluster organizations based on how different they are in terms of their approach, behaviors, strategic orientation, digitalization, culture, and importantly, the impact that they have on the organization. So this has led us to develop our four-stage organizational learning maturity model. So organizations in stage one are those that are having what we describe as surface impact and focusing on short-term gains. Whereas those in stage four, which we call top performers, are having the deepest impact. Now, many of you who follow our study will be well aware of this language um, that we use consistently. The LPB survey, the Learn Performance Benchmark survey, explores six key dimensions. So we look at strategic and business alignment, learning impact, their environment, talent and culture, L&D team capabilities, organizational engagement, and employee experience. 
And based on these responses, organizations are scored from, from 0 to 100, 0 meaning they are doing nothing in terms of key strategic behaviors, and 100 meaning they are doing all the key strategic behaviors. This is what we call our organizational learning index, which is what we use to group organizations in what we do. So what's the health of the industry? Let's have a look at what the organizational learning index is saying this year. When the overall organizational learning index goes up, this means that today organizations are on average doing better than they were a year ago. However, as we can see this year, the increase is marginal. This year it's gone up from 48.08 to 48.23, which suggests that things haven't really changed that much in the last 12 months. And I think this is reflecting how people are explaining that they have had a lot of activity just in the chat that we just chased um, that we just had earlier but what they're not necessarily seeing yet is that impact coming through and what they're also getting is a slightly messy and ambiguous message back from the business in terms of some of that broader impact and how that is coming through so the aim of this report really is to unpack on a much closer level what differences there are and we do this throughout the report where we present longitudinal data for the past five or more years. And Joe, you've just mentioned that in the chat, as I can see, that having that longitudinal data is really important. And what we see happening through the data is that organizations are improving in some areas, for example, they're responding faster to changing organizational conditions, but they're struggling in others. For example, they're not collecting and analyzing data relevant to learning impact in the most effective way. So let's have a look at the proportion of LND leaders at each stage of maturity. And I think this explains really um, why the index has moved to the level that it has moved. And I think it's really interesting that over 75% of participants that completed the learning performance benchmark are still in stages one and two. And if you look at that figure of 56% being in stage one, Stage one and two, remember, is transactional impact. It's non-behavioral. Um, top performing L&D leaders are two or three times more likely to report a reduction in employee turnover, an increase in organizational productivity, and an increase in organizational revenue. And really, that is the, the kind of the secret source of the top of the top deck of what they're doing and what they're doing really well. But what's really interesting when we look at what L&D leaders are reporting is that that transactional space is really where they are living today. It's consistently, um, as Anna has just put in the chat, the largest group um, of organizations year on year, which um, Don and I reflected on earlier is um, slightly disappointing that we're not really seeing that shift year on year. So what's been the impact of continuing rapid digitalization? There's no surprises that the focus on collaborative tools rather than content related tools has increased. So digital tools that aid collaboration continue to be a top priority for LND teams. And that's likely explained by obviously the sudden increase in remote working and above most things, the need for organizations to stay connected. The concern, however, for us, and we talk about this in the report, is that organizations view these tools as being the solution to working and learning challenges when really they play a supporting role. And this is why we, when we talk about rapid digitalization, what we're talking about really is the cultural mindset that needs to change with that. In 2022, legacy expectations are continuing to hold L&D teams back. Um, and when we look at um, what L&D teams are reporting, reluctance by managers to encourage new ways of learning and working is increasing. And this is really, really interesting because when things move too quickly, it's hard to keep up. Organizations have struggled so far because they haven't necessarily been ready for that digital surge. And technology is powerful and vital for business success, but it enables outcomes rather than producing them. In truth, employees are, best, are your best resource organizations, and they are the ones that are going to ensure a smooth transformation. So I think what's really interesting in here is that um, we are 
we are really seeing that there are some concerns coming through from L&D around lack of investment to future-proof L&D approaches. If you look at where that is, extremely concerned. Reluctance by managers to make time for learning. This is really interesting, um, and we'll come on to it um, a bit later on. But we, we are also seeing that um, there is a bit of a disconnect between what L&D are reporting and some of the insights that we've reported from learners. But I'll touch on that on the next slide. If we look at the reported achievements associated with, with data change and innovation, initially the implementation of new technologies looked positive. And if you look at the schools in 2021, they were great to see. The index went up, a lot of L&D were reporting great scores in this area. And across the first 12 months of the pandemic, when widespread digital transformation was still in, in, in its infancy, organizations, as we've just highlighted in the chat, um, made widespread, um, quick and significant progress. They facilitated new ways of working and were utilizing internal data. But in 2022, these same achievements have plummeted and most returned to pre-pandemic levels, which is disappointing and in some cases it's lower. It appears that organizations are struggling to sustain the short-term gains they made in 2021, which is also true for those that they made in relation to their employees. Now, what's interesting is, and I alluded to it on the previous um, slide, L&D leaders are reporting that attitudes towards learning are at their lowest point in three years, and employees aren't as engaged as they were during the height of the pandemic, and the appeal of digital learning is wearing off a bit. We've heard that a bit in other reports and other um, insights that we've seen about digital fatigue. But actually, insight from our own learner intelligence report points to a slightly different story, with confidence in digital tools increasing, and people actually reporting that they are increasing their confidence and um, their engagement with digital. So there is a disconnect here somewhere, and this is something that we really want to explore over here at MindTools. You know, are L&D asking the right questions? Are they seeking the correct insights? Or is this based on their perception or what they are hearing from the business? So I think there are some really, really interesting insights coming through on this. So what we want to cover with you today are some key insights from the different sections of the report. We want to talk a bit about being proactive about the future, investing and in growing talent, cultural innovation and partnering, digitalization and learning solutions. And this is really to better understand what rapid digitalization means for organizational, learn, organizational learning and why learning cultures are pivotal in ensuring that the digital investments that your organizations have made are worthwhile. And we'll be, we'll be drawing on data from the learning performance benchmark. Although it won't be possible to go deeper on the webinar today, we wanted to really whet your appetite with some key insights, including what top performing teams are doing differently, what the challenges are in each of these areas, and what L&D teams can do from a behavioral perspective to have positive organizational impact. So when we think about being proactive about the future, we grouped goals relating to future proofing, for example, growth, innovation, capability to solve new problems, and we ran a number of statistical tests to best understand what behaviors predict achievement. There are a number of key behaviors that differentiate top performers from the rest, and we wanted to talk you through some of these. Before we do that, we wanted to really look at what does a future-proof organization look like? And this is very similar to the behaviors that we're going to see top performers are displaying. And what we're seeing is that they are quick to respond to change and are successful at managing risk. They ensure that learning methods evolve as working conditions change, and they consider the capabilities required to solve problems and grow the business. In their own words, L&D leaders report feeling concerned about continuous change and ambiguity. And when asked what they want, they report a desire to enhance the capabilities of the team and upskill foundation development skills such as coaching. Importantly, what L&D leaders want, exactly, want is exactly what they need. So when we asked L&D leaders this year around reported achievements associated with future proofing, they are reporting less achievements on average, especially when it comes to utilizing internal data. 
building organizational capabilities to solve problem and increasing innovation. And these are behaviors that really do contribute to a, for, uh, a forward thinking and future proofing organization. And when we look at the difference in future-proofing achievements between low and high-performing L&D teams, you can see that some of the um, multiples are staggering. So using, utilizing internal data to future-proof the organization, low performers on average are only doing that 3% of the time as opposed to high performers. Even then, Don and I reflected on this when we were going through the slides. Um, the high performers are also only doing that 39% of the time, but when compared with the, 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 the slightly lower performers, we're seeing a much greater um, opportunity to do that. They're building organizational capabilities to solve problems. They're really understanding the key critical capability needs that the business requires and increasing innovation, and they have an accelerated response time to changing organizational conditions, which we've already mentioned earlier. A lot of these actions are to do with discovery, exploration, and ensuring curiosity is baked into L&D strategy. Many of these include the utility of data involving external partners or internal experts, as well as ensuring that people are clear on how this will link to performance. And if we look at some of these, one, some of these ones here, we use data analytics to improve the service we deliver. These figures are stark <laughs> when you look at what low performers and high performers are doing. We draw on internal business expertise to support learning, marketing, data analytic experts. And, you know, it's really, really interesting. Our people understand how their work is linked to the organization's performance. You know, the difference between what low, low performers are doing and high performers are doing. This is a really, really interesting one. Um, and Anna is sharing some interesting insights about um, using internal data and the use of experts in the chat. So what are top performing organizations doing right? Amongst other things, including developing a strategy that allows for changing business priorities and auditing the skills of their L&D team, top performing organizations rely on and develop their internal experts. It's behaviors like drawing on internal business expertise to support learning and succession planning that directly predicts how ready organizations are for the future. By stark contrast, if we look at organizations at the lower stage of our maturity model, they are lagging way behind. But it appears that in 2022, all organizations are prioritizing the use of internal experts less than they were in 2021. And that's across all the stages, so even top performers included. Fewer organizations are drawing on internal business expertise. And even fewer are formalizing approaches um, to working with internal subject matter experts. So how does relying on internal experts contribute to future learning your um, future-proofing your learning. Your employees know your business better and its needs better than anyone else. And that knowledge is key. Because of this knowledge, they can respond to new problems quickly and effectively, and in many cases, even spot them before they arise. Research shows that this understanding of organization that puts internal experts at the strongest position to be your agents of change on a continual basis while maintaining day-to-day -day operations, a combination that is considered vital for organizational survival and long-term success. So if we look at behaviors that contribute to a future-proof learning and development approach, here we see that top-performing organizations are proactive in their approach to learning. This includes developing a learning strategy that allows for changing business priorities, using analytics to improve the way that they do things, auditing um, the capabilities of their L&D team and making sure employees understand how their work is linked to the organizational performance, which is what I shared on the slide earlier. In fact, many of the behaviors above go neatly hand in hand. If we take, we have audited the skills of our L&D team against those required as an example, to audit skills, organizations must start with an understanding of what their L&D team are currently capable uh, of doing and how their skills align with business outcomes. And by taking the time to work with employees in this way, organizations help them to understand how their work is linked to the organization's performance, 
Not only that, but organisations are then able to make smarter decisions. We're going to have top performing organisations, those with the most high impact learning cultures, are 20 times more likely to benchmark their learning strategy against other companies in their industry than less mature organizations. And this is a really, really important statistic that we really want you to think about. So really understanding and taking the time to benchmark your strategy is going to be a really important part and way in which you can move forward. If we look at trends in L&D team capabilities in-house, Despite 98% of L&D leaders considering analytical capabilities to be a priority for their strategy, this capability is actually in decline for the past five years. And this is a really interesting aspect for us to think about and for us to look at. However, L&D leaders cannot do this without having the necessary capabilities in-house. And this is also a critical issue for top performers too. While they are ahead, data is increasingly an critical ingredient of staying as a part of a top performing team. If we look at differences in capabilities between low and high performing L&D teams, we can see that collaborative learning, and um, somebody mentioned this earlier on in the chat, is a, is a consistently high capability of high performing L&D capability teams. Classroom delivery, um, interestingly, is the focus of lower performing teams. But when we look at analytics, high performing teams are really focusing in this area, as well as learning management. Virtual classroom is very, very interesting. And it was there on the previous slide, but virtual classroom, if I flip back to the previous slide, has consistently grown with no surprise over the year. But if we look at what top performing teams are doing, they are investing L&D capability in this area very, very strongly. So we're going to take a pause point here. I can see the chat is on fire, um, if that's the right term to use. How are you it utilizing is on fire. data it is the right term. as a part of your LNOD strategy? Share in the chat, please. And while we're just uh, while we're just waiting for people to answer that question, there's a there's a um, a question from Anna Trap Jensen asking, "What does a learning strategy contain?" So, do you want to just reflect on that now, Nadia, or would you like to wait until the end to to look at that? I think I think if we look at the um, one of the benefits of doing the learning performance benchmark would be my question to that, because if we look at the um, if I can probably go back to the slide, it's probably the best way to describe you, 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 it. Don't, don't do that for the moment. Let's stick, let's, stick with the, uh, <laughs> let's stick with the question. Let's keep people focused on the question here. Let's keep um, people so, focused. You're absolutely right. Um, um, people are saying they can't follow me and follow the chat. <laughs> There's a lot going well, that's on. The, that's the, that's the um, trouble. Um, and, and, uh, let, me, let me just answer that question for a minute, Nadia, if I may. Now, uh, Yvette van der Meer, I, I, I totally get it. The, very often with learning skills group webinars, we have a lot of chat going on at the same time. It, it, what I'd ask you to do with that, and it may be true for other people on the call as well, so thank you for raising the point. If the chat's going on and everything else, at this point, this is a great moment to just focus on that big box underneath the slide. If you're using data as part of your learning and organizational development strategy, please answer it. If the rest of the time the chat is getting very busy and noisy and it's difficult to, to, to follow it, then please feel free just to ignore the chat. Carol says, yes, actually, it is quite difficult at first. It gets easier over time. And it's true that we've been doing these for 15 years. And so we, we have a group of people who are, who are used to doing it. Anna's solution is make the slides go full screen. Actually, I'll make a point of telling everybody how to do that next time we get together. So thank you. Yvette, thank you for raising the point. Uh, and she's gone to full screen as well. OK. Um, now, let's, go, let's come back to the question about strategy and using data as part of the L&D strategy. Um, IFAF says budgetary, budgetary decisions. 
Michael says we're still behind the curve, to be honest. Um, and the primary measure remains bums on seats. And Michael, thank you for mentioning that. I think that for a lot of organisations, the transitory, transactional measures of activity is by and large the main data point. So, and Anna says we're not doing it at the same. We're not using it at the same ourselves. We get basic reports in the LMS. Uh, we need to get better. And I think you know, this is this is it. And Peter says the same thing. Not enough. Our focus seems to be on fixing problems. So, Nadia, there's a common theme coming through here, which is people would like to do more. Uh, they recognise that reactive data um, uh, is, is useful, but it's not enough. Uh, and David says, I think we get data at the wrong time after budgets are done. We have to track back and sift things around. Some people are more positive. So Marianne is saying to demonstrate the value of the training and so on. But Jed is saying, look, um, well, he's putting some alternative uh, data points in here. Our strategy, says Carol, is somewhat out of date. I provide analytics, but have my doubts about whether L&D management are using it. And I do quite a wide range of answers there. A lot of people saying... We're probably not doing enough with our data. What's, what's your take on that? I think it's um, reflective of what we're seeing in the data when we look at what, um, you know, if we look at the fact, if we take the, the, the top line statistics, 75% of organisations are in that transactional space, Don, and we know that those of lower maturity are simply not analysing data, um, even if they're collecting it, they're just simply not analysing it. Um, they're also not analysing the business problem that they're trying to solve either. Um, and I think those two are quite quite strongly linked. Um, so I'm not surprised that this is the case. And I, I do believe that this is, this is really what we're trying to get across in the report, that it's a shift in mindset to really understand that the top deck are very, very intentional. Remember, they're the top 10% of our study, but they are very, very intentional about even why they're collecting data. So it's not data just for the sake of collecting data. It's how do you um, really understand the problem that you're trying to solve, setting up the correct kind of measures against that and using the technology to be able to answer those questions, then looping it back within the business to be able to show the change that it has made. So the point that was made earlier, you know, are we simply collecting data, for the want of a better word, sticking it in the top drawer and not looking at it, but we're yeah. comfortable with the fact that we're collecting the data is, is really um, not enough. It's, we have to be prepared for that. And, and it's the one thing I know that can often be a barrier for people doing the learning performance benchmark. You know, nobody wants to know necessarily that they're at the lower level of maturity, but if you don't know where you are, you don't know how you're going to improve. And it was something that we were commenting on earlier, wasn't it, Don, yesterday, that, you know, the fact that we are consistently seeing, as Anna Barnett shared in the chat, that people are still in that stage one level of maturity year on year. What is that showing? Is that showing us that people are simply doing it once, not coming back, not changing, not really picking up on the steps that they need to take in between that? And we're going to be doing a bit of work around really starting to track, you know, what, what you know, are, if people are consistently benchmarking and not moving, what's actually happening there? What's what you know? What's not changing in the culture, which um, obviously is very very um, closely linked to what we're um, covering today. Mm. I think that process you described that you work out what you're trying to achieve and use the data just to decide whether you are on course or not, it, rather than collecting data and see, and, and of course you have, to, you have to use data to tell you what it's telling you, to, to you know, describe the outlook. But I think it's really important to be, as the word you've used and Joe's picked up on it, intentional about what's going on, yeah. I think is really important. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so, much, so much going on here. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you, because I know we're a bit tight on, on yes. we've got a lot of content to get through, so I'm going to ask you to press on. Um, let's, let's push on with the, um, let's sure. push on with the presentation, but thank you so much everyone for sharing it. And by the way, Yvette van der Meer has talked about uh, using an evaluation system called LTEM, devised by Will Talheim. I put a link in the main chat about that. Uh, it's a really useful uh, way of looking at evaluation. Thank you. Now, let's, let's press on. Perfect.
Right, so um, investing and growing talent, um, what L&D behaviours have led to achievements in this area? So we grouped goals related to investing and growing talent, um, increasing retention, increasing the attractiveness of the company as a place to work, impro uh, improving employee well-being, performance management and onboarding. And um, there are a number of key behaviours that differentiate top, beha top performers from the rest and we wanted to share some of those with you today. So what's interesting is again what we are seeing is a reduction in the, over, in the, in the overall um, uh, benchmark. We are seeing a reduction in reported achievements associated with some of those behaviours which are improved induction, the onboarding process, strengthened employee well-being, um, you can see them on, on the slide. But goals related to performance management have suffered the most since last year, dropping from 23% in 2021 to only 14% in um, 2022. And if top performing employees are to stick around, they want to feel supported by their organisations. So if we're looking at you know, a reduction in, in um, employee well-being, um, are they going to be? Are they? Are they actually feeling supported? And for there to be a focus on learning and career, um, learning and career development, and for there to be opportunities to learn at work. Um, and while there has been a reported dip in achievement across the board when it comes to talent goals, it's the performance management one that has really struck out for us um, quite strongly in this area. Mainly because performance management is consistently linked with a reduction in employee turnover. Not just our study, but numerous um, research studies, which we go into um, in a bit of depth, um, have shown in, in the report have shown that a focus on performance management, and that is a continuous feedback loop that helps communicate and reinforce business priorities, ensures that goal setting is dynamic and a continuous process, and consistently, top performers are six times more likely to integrate performance management into their learning cultures. With, where its foundation, as we know, is rooted in coaching, managers meet employees on a regular basis and measure their performance using real-time feedback and metrics. So if we look at the behaviours reported um, achievements and talent investment by L&D teams, um, our organisation encourages and provides time for reflection. This comes back to the point um, that we have consistently built on, top performing organisations are 20 times more likely than low performing organisations to encourage people to reflect um, on their work practices, on learning in the flow of work, on how they are improving. And the fact that um, they are developing their managers to be coaches, succession planning is integrated into how we develop our people. So as we said, the, the, you know, the behaviours above are strong predictors of talent management success and performance management being integrated into the learning strategy is a really, really important part of this. But it's also, um, you can use performance data to measure impact and drive engagement through digital tools, um, identifying actions that employees should take to achieve business outcomes. And an increase in remote working, and why is this important? So why is it important? Why is talent investment important? An increase in remote working has meant that the talent pool has geographically expanded, and we know our organisations are going through this on a daily basis. Um, but regardless of where employees work, they still want to be connected to each other. So, and, and the hybrid workforce is going to create even more challenges for us in this space. So organisations really need to understand that supporting collaboration and the use of collaborative technologies in learning will be a strong way of retaining talent. I'm going to take a pause point here because performance management, I think, is a, a critical uh, piece that we should discuss. Is performance management a priority for you? Um, are the participants on today's webinar reflective of what we're seeing in the study? And how are you incorporating it into your LNOD strategy? Um, I'd be really interested in your views, as I'm sure Don would be in the chat. One thing I'm interested in, Nadia, here in particular, is um, who the you is in this question. So. It may be that we're asking, are we asking about the organization as a whole? 
is performance management important for the organisation? Or are we asking about... So the question is asked of learning and development in the benchmark, and obviously they are the ones that are filling it in. I think it, you ask, it's a really interesting point. Um, we, as a part of um, some of our work, we also work with organisations where they want to do a deeper dive of their learning strategy, and it involves bringing in the view of business leaders. And I think it's an important point to, to mention here, Don, that when you ask um, LNOD, they will often say that although performance management is seen as an important um, point that is put forward from business leaders, there isn't always the alignment there between business and LNOD in really enforcing the importance of it. But for the purposes of this study, we've asked LNOD how they are incorporating performance management, and this is what they are reporting back. But I think if you broaden that question, um, if you broaden that okay, so insight, looking into how much of a responsibility is that of LNOD and how much of that is the responsibility of business leaders and managers aligning together to really understand the importance mm -hmm. of that. Uh, and your view is that performance management is is incredibly important for a variety of reasons which you can back up with data. Yeah, yeah, around the, the fact that people stay longer, work, and perform yeah. better if they they have performance management. Um, Anna Trapp Jensen asked, "What defines a high performing team?" And Anna has responded in terms of top performing organisations are those at the highest stage of maturity model. Um, uh, Peter is saying, "We have a, a strong push for continuous dialogue." Now, I think Peter is talking about this in, in contrast yes. to the annual performance review, where you 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 go through a list of questions and and that's something you don't revisit for another 12 months and peter's saying we have a strong push for continuous dialogue supporting relationships between employees and management but in practice it hasn't felt like it's been very well implemented yet peter thank you for that it, it is actually difficult to make that switch it, it it's not something that can be done from the top it's a cultural change everyone has to feel it will work and i've heard people who've done it but it has taken time for it to bed in jed says quantitative engagement mm. data is the priority um, for as, as the foundation for performance. Andre says it's it's an important topic for us to get our partners we train to build the skills of their employees as there's a massive drain of talent. So to, performance important, very important for Andre. Simon says, yeah, it, it is important, but you need to define Absolutely. and believe in measures that make a difference. So not much coming through in contrast to some of the other questions you've asked, Nadia, where there's like a sort of tidal wave of stuff coming through. Good answers, but not very many answers in contrast to the rest. What do you think that, that tells us about I think it learning tells us, um, performance um, management? And, uh, you know, it, as you've just said, it does take time to embed these things, and our cultures are not necessarily set up for them. Because in many cases, as we can see, if mm. performance management is declining as a skill and we are measuring it less, and most organisations are in the earlier stage of their learning maturity, those conversations are probably where they are mm. to the point um, that Peter said, you know, it's not just an annual kind of catch up. Um, so I think they're still in yeah. that transactional space. And what this is highlighting is that this isn't something which is just an LNOD issue to solve. But what this is highlighting no. is that if, if they are not prioritizing it as a capability um, or they haven't got the skill internally, then what this is highlighting is that it either has to be picked up somewhere else in the business or we're never going to see that step change that we need to see. And to Peter's point about the continuous piece, that is essentially, you know, in classic terms, when we talk about performance management, it's not just your half yearly review, your annual review. It's having a very, very agile approach to managing performance mm. and building it into the flow of work and building it into how people are thinking about their development and aligning it with business priorities in a really strong way. And to Simon's point, strategic, tactical, it has to be um, really clear. Again, coming back to that point, you've got to be really intentional about the performance improvement you're looking to see occur, if you see what I mean. You know, what, 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 are you, what is the change that you're looking to see? Yeah. Managing someone's performance it's, it's the intentional. It, it has been intentional. You know, what, are, what is the yeah. point of managing you, that? 
if you yeah. don't know. And and Pete, Peter's point about the Peter's point about the dialogue is a really good one. And and Michael's point, which I think sort of echoes that strangely, is yes, but it still has a connotation of poor performance, which of course he says it shouldn't. The idea if you if you're on performance management, well, are you on a performance improvement plan? Is there something wrong with you? Are people trying to find a way to get you out of your job? Uh, which of course is not what should be happening. It's exactly why the uh, idea of continuous dialogue is so good, but it's still an issue. I think we're seeing that L and D, Steve Jones, kind of wraps the whole thing up here, is not considered as the main driver for performance, or possibly even, Steve, a driver for performance. For the business, it's about achieving work objectives. And I think that's a really yeah. fundamental point, Steve. Thank you for raising it. And look, we've got an time. interesting point Sorry, about hybrid Nadia, working. And I think this is... Um... This is a really interesting challenge around yes. managing performance. In some ways, when we were all remote, um, we probably <laughs> never in our careers spent that much one-to-one -one time with our managers than we did during those early heady days of the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and you know, you had a lot of kind yes. of insight and um, access to managers who previously you may have had the occasional one-to-one -one with, but there is now more of a rhythm of people having more check-ins with their managers and hybrid I think is presenting quite an interesting challenge um, around this because depending on um, you know there are things around proximity bias you know whether people can come into the office and leaders are in the office are they the ones who are getting more access um, in comparison to people who are 100% now remote so hybrid is going to present an interesting challenge and um, I think you're absolutely right it is going to put a strain I think that the issue around the tools, you know, we have a lot of digital technologies out there that will help us do performance management well. What they won't do is help us have those conversations and make them meaningful and intentional. And that really is a mindset yes. change. Yeah. The tools are not going to they change won't. the culture. Shall we move on? No, the tools won't change the culture, will they? Absolutely. Well, yeah, look, Yvette is just <laughs> typing something. I want to give Yvette a chance to type that thing in because I, 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 she's made a couple of really useful contributions. I'd like to give her the opportunity. I will. Uh, do you want to just move on the slide at the top and yeah. we'll just get Yvette's thoughts? So when we look there. at, um, is Yvette typing? She, okay. Well, it says she's typing. You keep, you keep going. Well, if she Brilliant. types it, we'll, we'll capture it. And so then we, we can, group we goals go related forward. to cultural innovation and partnering. I okay. um, increase self-determined learning, integrating learning into the flow of work, which we've just um, had a bit of a conversation around, facilitating continuous learning, leveraging networks. And there are a number of key behaviours that differentiate top performers from the rest, and we wanted to, again, talk you through some of those. And I think a fundamental reason why um, L&D leaders achieved key goals in 2021 was their ability to partner with stakeholders. Um, and we can see that, you know, leveraging their connections to create this positive um, organizational impact. Um, but now in 20, in, in, you know, uh, what we're seeing is only 13% have reported achieving this goal compared to 23% in 2021. So that number is going down. And the use of available networks is a key behavior for top performing teams. And this is something that they do particularly well. And again, the differences in achievements um, related to culture and partnering between low and high performing teams is quite interesting. Um, developing a continuing learning culture is hard. It's hard even for high performers, as we can see. They are, you know, their, their number is higher, but again, it is not at the levels that it probably should be. Um, leveraging networks to drive transformation, again, that is happening. Strengthening communication and teamwork, we can see the high performers doing well there. So this, you know, achievements related to culture are hard work. There is no, um, what is the best way to describe it? There is no easy way around this. There is no, um, you know, uh, secret bit of tech that is going to sort that out for you. What will actually move the culture is a shift in mindset and a change in that cultural space. And if we look at um, 
reported challenges related to cultural innovation and partnering, this year L&D leaders are facing tougher task of securing investment to future-proof their strategy and approach. And we can see that here, um, that the, you know, the, numbers, the numbers again are not pointing in an upward trajectory there. Um, and what is interesting, that um, consistently we're seeing learning not being seen as a management and a leadership priority. Conversely, I will say here, um, when we look at the data and um, from learners and from business leaders, we see something quite different on learning not being seen as a management and a leadership priority. Um, but I guess that's where, that's where the disconnect lives. And if we look at um, managers, you know, high performing teams are 13 times more likely to ensure their managers encourage and make time for social and informal learning in their teams and seven times more likely to use digital technology to help their employees build networks and to collaborate internally. So again, um, the numbers here are very, very interesting. When you look at intentional top performing organization um, and I think it's, it's, it's vitally important. Um, we did have a couple of people talk about social and informal learning earlier. And what we are seeing is that high performing organizations are doing much better in this place. They are prioritizing this as a key area for themselves. And using digital technology to help individual build networks is a really um, important kind of uh, area for them. So how do you currently partner with key stakeholders and what have you found works well? I'm going to suggest, Nadia, because we've got like three minutes to go, that we just press on. I'm going to ask people to answer this in the general chat rather than sure. using this as a chat exercise. Let's just let's let's press on. And uh, if you've got to answer that question about how you're working with stakeholders, please let us know in the general chat area. Absolutely. Right, I'm going to leap straight into this. So when we looked at reported achievements associated with digitalization and, and solutions, there was a real achievement spike again in 2021 um, when we looked at that. Um, in particular, LNDs reported achieving better personalization, enhanced ability to gather and analyze data on learning impact and much more. However, again, many of these gains have been reverted back in 2022 with the largest drop being an improved application of learning in the workplace i think this is really really interesting and this highlights what we we um, heard very early on in the chat when we asked that first question that what we're seeing is you know a massive trajectory interest um, dynamism in that area and now when we're actually looking at that measuring that that learning impact that those those pieces are going back down again. And if we look at digitalization, um, some of these figures, so enhanced data collection and analysis on learning impact, we've had this already in the chat. And um, what we're hearing is that the majority of our organizations are still collecting very transactional data. High performers are consistently performing well in this area. And when we look at personalized learning to employee needs, which we know is a key facet of a lot of our learning strategies, you know, only 10% of us are reporting any sense of achievement in that when we compare it to high performing L&D teams. All of this data with the um, added narrative is in the report. So you will have the um, opportunity to look at. So um, apart from a steep increase in the use of virtual classrooms, technology usage over the six year period has been fairly stable which is making us ask um, some more questions around this really to look at really if we are seeing quite a consistent um, uh, level of reported achievement to um, uh, use of digital solutions why are we not seeing that increase in the impact and of course some of that has already been covered in the report but it's something Anna and Gent Hamataj who is our head of research are going to be exploring further when we look at behaviors associated with reported achievements in digitalization as well, we use data analytics to understand the employee's learning needs. If you look at that multiple, it's pretty staggering, that top one at 24. Our learning strategy ensures that employees can learn um, and um, 
can learn collaboratively. 90% of top performing organizations are doing that. So regardless of the rapid digitalization, they are using tools to ensure they're actually leveraging those tools to enhance and ensure that that is happening. Um, we know what digital solutions to learning our IT can deliver. I think that is really interesting um, because we know that sometimes that can be a huge barrier in some of our more compliant organizations. Now I'm just going to wrap it up um, Don with a couple of slides at the end. Um, we have a section at the back of the report which really gives you key insights and related tips not just for short-term achievable um, gains that can be made but also a longer term aspirational based on some of the key insights that we pulled out on the report because we really really wanted you to be able to go away having immersed yourself in the report understood all of the data and the insights and what the stories are to really think okay what do I do next sometimes that long term aspirational depending especially where you are in your learning maturity and we of course always encourage you to do the learning performance benchmark because how do you know where you want to get to if you don't know where you are today? But some of those long-term aspirational are difficult. Um, and sometimes we need short-term, achievable, low-hanging fruit that we can really start working on um, to move us forward. One of the things I wanted to share with you was to summarize two kind of points that um, I want to think about when we look at this report, is that there is more to L&D than money. We have seen in this year's study that most of our mature organizations are spending less per employee, on average £98 less, and we have a whole section on budget. Uh, and they're also spending the least on digital technologies and also using a blended approach to learning with a mixture of in-house and external providers. They're experimenting and being very intentional about their investments and clearly identifying their business priorities. Um, and even though 97% of top performing organizations are now integrating learning technologies into their face-to-face -face training, we still believe it's people first and technology second. So the technology is great. It is um, allowing us to do so much, um, especially with the rapid digitalization, not just of our L&D um, technology, but the rapid digitalization of our organizations as a whole and their business processes. But without bringing your people along with you, without looking at that cultural piece, um, it is not going to deliver the impact that you're looking for. Finally, if we get to the final slide, <laughs> please download the report. Here is the link, and I know that Don has... Um, I'm going to move to the wrap up. I'm going to move to the, sorry, I'm going to move to the wrap up. We've, we've just seen the, 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 picture, the lovely picture of the report. I'm just going to drop the... The link is there on the left-hand side. Download the report, it says. Um, we've also got a the link to download the slides. A lot of people were asking about the slides. Uh, so much content there. Also, feel free to down, to copy, uh, sorry, to email Anna as well. And Anna's also gave us a great link, which is to uh, to take part in the benchmark report itself. Uh, here we go. There's the, there's the actual link to do the benchmark itself. Um, we are now actually at one o'clock. Um, it, 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 there was a tremendous amount in there. It's been, um, Philip's saying, I'm getting a block on the link download. Could you, if it's Microsoft Edge, could you try another another um, browser, Philip? Tell us if that's the problem or, or if there's something else. Anna perhaps can handle that. Because we're at time, uh, I really wanted to raise a couple of questions at the end. Uh, I'm going to say to everybody, look, we, we'll run over by five minutes. I'll ask, I'll ask Nadia some questions that I've, I've stored up. But if you need to go, by all means go. Uh, that's the, those are the key uh, resources on the left-hand side of the screen there. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to everybody in the room. We have uh, 90 people really contributing, sharing, thinking, bringing all of your experience to bear. As we said at the beginning, the answer to the question is almost always in the room. Thank you for bringing that with you. Uh, Nadia, I'm going to just throw a, a, a quick question to you about, I mean, there was so much that was coming in. Um, I think a, 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 one I'd like to pick is from Simon Craythorne saying, uh, the tools aren't enough. You raised the point at the end that it's never about the technology, it's about the people. Um, but he said, look, we set up the digital platforms for remote meetings to challenge us, but we need to challenge the assumption that that's enough. That are there enough for, treat, for teaching? 
without looking at the right platforms. And he says in particular, investing in the right skills. So your point about it, it's not just about the technology, it's about the, the people as well. How much do we need to look at our own people in, in who are doing training, who are in learning and development to make sure that they are capable of delivering in this hybrid world we're now in? Nadia. I think we do, and if we if we um, refresh our, our minds back to the slide where we looked at L and D capabilities, um, virtual classroom has um, clearly gone up out of necessity and need. But if you look at the top three capabilities that um, uh, L and D L and O D are reporting on, Don, they're still very very traditional L and D capabilities in terms of where they see where they see themselves putting their priority areas into. So I think it's absolutely um, part and parcel of um, understanding what are the skills that L&D need to not feel so um, overwhelmed mm. by some of the challenges that they're facing. And especially, as you say, around uh, some of the hybrid workplace and what what you know what what is that going to take us through investment in digital technologies will will take you and has enabled organizations to build that collaboration in as we as I shared at the end you know 97% of top deck are incorporating collaborative technologies into how they're doing it but they're also spending time and upskilling LNOD into those future skills that they're going to need you know social collaborative learning how they develop the, in, in those areas but also I think one of the areas that we um, I you know I'm hoping that we're, we're going to put a report out later on in the year which mm -hmm. is going to look at business leaders views on learning but one of the areas that I also think and, and, and within that space business leaders were also talking about managers is that the role there, you know there is a real role for managers here as well around how you involve and enable managers to be your your coaches almost within yep. the business to help deliver some of that cultural change um, and we talk a lot about that in um, our learner intelligence report which came out in may which really talks about consistently when it comes to who um, advises people on their learning and who do who do individual employees go to when they want to be recommended for learning your, your manager or your colleague continues to be the most important person. So I think there is there is absolutely a need for, for business leaders to support LNOD with ensuring that they've got the right skills in-house within the team. There is the, um, the desire and the requirement for LNOD to do some of that reflection themselves and doing something like the learning performance benchmark, I mm. think, because we do produce um, uh, an LND uh, capability kind of skills piece there if you do it as a team um, enables them to understand where they are there so it's not, it's never a responsibility of just one you know the, what we're what we're sharing today really are the sentiments and the views of how LNOD are feeling yeah. and where they are reporting that they feel they're achieving something and where they are reporting that they're not what we've kind of produced around the report is the importance for that um, emphasis to shift and to be more intentional if we're going to see the impact of the rapid digitalization and the investments that we've made. Thank you for that. It's a very comprehensive answer. I think it raises the point that the technology is never enough and it's not just the L&D team. Uh, you're absolutely right. The managers are the crucial people who are the conduit to actually making performance happen. And that's that's what we get to. People are starting to say, look, we, we need to drop out. I noticed that we're more than five minutes over time, which is a, a terrible sin for a for a, uh, a host to, to allow that to happen. Nadia, thank you so much. Those links on the left-hand side, download the report, please. I've, I've checked the URL, it does work. Uh, so it, it, maybe you need to go through a different browser or possibly do it outside your uh, firewall at work if there's an issue with downloading. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Um, URL work, Yvette's got the report, fabulous, okay. Uh, look, look at those plaudits coming through, Nadia. People very much uh, enjoying this. It's been so, um, it's been so informative and it's only really scratched the surface. I do recommend it. It's 52 pages and it's packed full of information, but I do recommend downloading and reading the report. All right. Gone past two o'clock in, in Europe, past one o'clock in the UK. We, it's time for a, a, probably a, a lunch or a cup of coffee or something. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I'm going to put the room on hold now. Thank Nadia, you, don't, don't go away. I'll just, I'll just catch up with you. But I want to say thank you very much, everyone. And in particular, thank you very much to Nadia Khan of Mind Tools for Business.